Good morning. morning. I'm excited to be in something new. I'm glad that we have walked through the Gospel of John, and now we are, for the next six weeks, looking at something that is foundational for all of our lives. We want to explore some questions, some basic questions, questions about what it means to be a Christian, what it means to follow Jesus Christ. I think every time we need to come back to some of the basics, there are some people in our body that don't know the basics, or some of us that have lost them along the way, and there's some that all of us that need to be reminded of the truth of God in simple terms. I hope that in this six-week series that actually it fosters a couple things. I hope that it brings up a lot more questions to you at your home, around the dinner table, in your car, in your community groups, that we become a people that know that it is very healthy and very necessary to ask questions, simple questions, strange questions, deep questions, to know, I want to know more about God. I don't understand that. What does that mean? Why do we believe that? Why do we do that? Why do we have to do that? And I hope also that it brings some clarity for our life, particularly in these categories that you see on the screen here, which is some of the ways that we will approach the next six weeks, today being being. What does it mean that God is so profoundly serious and concerned about who we are much more than what we do? He's primarily concerned with our being. Who are we? So what does it mean to be a Christian, to be a gospel person? And then to work for the next two weeks about why does it mean that God is so concerned for the Christian about our belief? Why does the Bible talk so much about believing? And then we'll look at two key issues. What do we actually believe about the Bible? What do we believe about worship? What does it mean? And then spend a week looking at our behaving God's concerned about our being, he's concerned about our believing, and he says all of this should impact our behaving. So how are we to live out as Christians? What does this mean for us? And then finishing with two parts of belonging. Part of the Christian message and what it means to be a Christian is that we belong to God and we belong to each other. So we have some basic questions. Why do I need to belong to a church? Why do I give offering to a church? Why do I serve at a church? And the last part, who's leading this church? What are pastors? What are shepherd leaders? What are ministry leaders? What do we expect out of them? What are they responsible for? What do they do? How do we pray for them? And so I'm excited about this time that I hope it opens up a lot of questions and that we will be a safe place as a church to ask questions, to come forward and to share in our groups. I appreciate some of you have taken advantage on our Facebook page and on our MyGraceRiver.life. There's a tab. You can still use it. Just click on it and you can submit your questions. Some people have had some great, great questions. And so I, I ask you, you can go ahead and keep sending your questions in. That'll shape some of our community group studies. We can, we can know what your questions are. So take advantage of that as we connect. As we come today um, to God's Word, we come to this question of being, of being, of who we are, of who God will make us to be. And we come to this foundational question of the Christian life, what exactly is the gospel? What is it? It's something that we know. We have books in the Bible called the gospels. Many of us have heard the gospel. Many of us are petrified to share the gospel. Many of us feel inadequate to answer people's questions about the gospel. And sometimes when I ask people, what do you think the gospel is? They look like a deer in headlights and say, you know. (laughs) So what is it? And particularly as we come to this question as Christians, we come at it to understand the gospel is more than just how we come into this life with Jesus Christ. This is more than just our salvation. This is actually something that the Christian needs to hear again and again that we are people who have heard and received the gospel. We are called to be people who live the gospel, gospel people, to be a gospel-centered church. And then we are people also called to then share the gospel. The gospel is to be heard, it's to be received, accepted, it's to be lived, and it is to be shared. 
And so that's why we come today to this question, that we might be better people who respond to the gospel and all that that means, respond to share it, respond to live it, respond to accept it, and most importantly, most deeply, to respond in thanksgiving for the God who has brought us this good news, to respond in praise. So as we do that, let's come to prayer. Father, we pray that as we are about to open our Bibles, that you will come and speak to us. Lord, I am a mere mortal. I am a flawed one at that. I'm standing up here to say your words, Lord, but our trust and our belief is that you will enter in with us in that divine dialogue where you will speak to your people. It's full of mystery, and it's also full of clarity. We pray, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, that in your word today, you will speak to us in ways that is life-changing, life-convicting, life-challenging, life-giving, life-transforming. Lord, we submit to your word today, and we ask that you will speak to those here that are near to you, speak to those here today who are far off from you, that all of us will know the good news of your Bible, of your message, of your Son, Jesus Christ. So today, Lord, we humble ourselves and submit ourselves to your teaching, and we ask that you will teach us what we need to know that you will give us today what we need to have, and you will make us who we need to be. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So understanding the gospel, one thing that should lead us today is to understand that what God is concerned about is our being. The gospel is primarily a transformation of our being, of who we are in our heart, in our mind, in our inner person, in our soul. It's a transformation from one category to another, from one being to another. It's a transformation of who we are. This term gospel is used over 90 times in the Bible. Today we offer a small survey of a couple of those passages and a couple key points to help us embrace this, accept it, live it, and share it. In the Greek, this word that we get the verb to gospelize and the noun gospel comes from, it's a Greek word, euangelion, which translates as good news. And the verb means one who brings, one who announces good news. And both the verb and the noun come from a word called angelos. Does that sound familiar to you? It's the word angel, which is means messenger. In the most literal meaning, it means a messenger. And these words come from that. To gospel lies, the gospel is a message. And it's a message that is heralded, that is proclaimed. It's a message of news, of news. In the ancient world, as we know, they didn't have newspapers. They didn't have cell phones. They got the news by someone coming into the town and shouting it shouting it out loud in the public square. So this word gospel and to be a gospelizer, to be a messenger of the gospel, isn't something terribly unique to the Bible. It was a word that was in use at the time in ancient Greece and Rome. It was a word that meant someone who came and announced and proclaimed a fact that was oftentimes bringing good news to the people. We have won the victory. We have defeated our enemies. We have a new king. There's a new Caesar. Caesar has done this. And they announce it as news, as fact. Not fake news. Not emotions. But whether you liked the Caesar or didn't like the Caesar, the announcement was this is what has happened. This is what has transpired. It is real. It is true. How will you now respond? And it's in that same context that the early church understood this gospel of Jesus Christ, that this was news that was proclaimed, that was shouted, that was told, that was heralded, a message that brought peace and joy because it was true. And the question that was left with people in all these different cities in the ancient world was, how will you now respond 
to this message that you have heard, message that brings joy. And so we come as we will each week to try to just hold on to one key point, one key truth, and that is this, is that the good news of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection for the forgiveness of our sins is God's powerful way to radically transform our being from dead to alive, from sinful to righteous, and from separated from God to being united in Christ. This is the good news. This is the content of the gospel. Jesus Christ's death and resurrection for the forgiveness of our sins. And this good news is not just information, but it's God's powerful way of transformation. That this word comes in simple words, but 1 Thessalonians tells us it comes in power and it comes in the working of the Holy Spirit as this is declared. And what it does is it transforms our being, our being. And out of a transformed being comes our doing. The central truth of the gospel is God has made a way. As we sang today, God has provided a way of salvation for men and women through the gift of his son, Jesus Christ, to the world. God has made a way of salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus, fully God, suffered as a sacrifice for sin. He overcame death. And now he holds out the offer of life, life abundant, life eternal, life with him, for him, and by him, and calls people to respond to that. And to all those who will accept it, they also are accepted. And the gospel is good news because it is a gift from God. It's good news because it's not something that we earn with our penance. It's not something we earn with our good behavior or our self-improvement. The good news is that it's a gift. And so, to try to give an overview of this today, I want to look at a couple passages, and we'll look at them kind of as an overview of the content of the gospel, what the gospel does, where it comes from, who it goes to, and what happens. And in the process, just highlight and underline a few things and then look at some key points, three of them, for what it means to live the gospel and understand it. If you turn with me, the first one we'll look at is in Colossians We won't go deep into any of these. I invite you to hold on to them and look at them in your own personal study. But we're trying to see what are some of the keys of the gospel. So Colossians chapter 1, if you're using this Bible, it's on page 983. And Paul says this to the people. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Just a few things. Paul has been an apostle of Jesus Christ by simply the will of God, by God's doing, by God's choosing, by God's will. And he says that Timothy is his brother. He's our brother now. What's happened? What has changed in these people? He calls them that he's writing to the saints and to these faithful Christians in Christ. This is strange language. He's writing to people who didn't grow up in Christian homes, People that haven't done any great acts in life to be called a saint, to be called holy people. What kind of strange language is this? He's talking to people who just a year or so previous would have been called pagans, would have been called godless people. And he's writing to them and he's calling them saints. Is he just trying to market his letter so that they will listen? He's writing just simply the truth that there's something that has changed about these people. 
that now they can be called saints, be called family. There's been some transformation in their being. He says, grace to you and peace, peace from God, reconciliation from God, our Father. And he says, we always thank them. And you see this three-part structure. We thank you for your faith, for your love, and your hope. We thank you for your faith now that you have in Christ Jesus, love that you have for these other people. And it's all because you have a different hope now, a hope and a belief and a trust that is in heaven. And it's changed who they are. It's changed their very being. And then he tells them, Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. We pick up something else that will be a highlight for us. The gospel is heard. The gospel is heard. He doesn't say that you simply looked at Epaphras' life and you said, I think there's something different about him. I'm going to give God a try. But he said you heard this message of peace and reconciliation. You heard this, and the gospel, the word of truth, has come to you. He's writing to a church of people who believed in God because the gospel has come to them. They have had a change in being. But these false gospels and false teachings have come into the church, things about angels and false worship and things they need to do. And in contrast, all that deceit and lies and the lies out in the world, he says, but you, you have this word of truth, which is a synonym for the gospel. He says, you have been given the truth and it has come to you and indeed it's going out in power to the whole world. And it's come to you and it's changed you. It's bearing fruit. It's doing something in you since the day you heard it and understood what it means to have the grace of God in truth. And very interesting word, he says, just as you learned it, that you learned the gospel. Not that someone gave you a five-minute pitch and said, you want to give your life to Jesus? But it was something that was steady, that was taught, that was learned, that they accepted. If you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, we see what is the content of the gospel. Paul summarizes really some of the most basic ingredients of the gospel. Death, burial, resurrection, appearance. This verses really give us the heart of what is the gospel. And we notice something unique here, that in the heart of the gospel is not only Jesus' death on a cross, it's his resurrection as well. That the early church understood the gospel as including the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received. And look, not only which they received, but in which they stand, in which they stand before God, in which you received past tense, in which you stand present tense, and then progressive, and by which you are being saved that there is salvation and sanctification and glorification all wrapped up in this gospel, that it's something that has changed you. It's something that you're standing in now in your present life with God, and it's something that's continuing to work in you. Oftentimes, we miss that with the gospel. If you hold fast to the word, I preach to you. So again, it was preached, it was heard, it was proclaimed, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received. And Paul emphasizes that he shares in the gospel simply what was given to him, what he received from God, what he received from the witnesses of God. He says, I am not adding to this. I'm not taking away. I'm just giving you what was first reported and what is of the key basics, what's most important, and what are those? He gives us four that statements, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that this was foretold, 
This is an agreement with prophecy. And he says, this is one of the key parts. This is what I'm delivering to you. The gospel is Christ died for our sins. That he was buried. That he was raised on the third day, also in accordance with the scriptures. And that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. And as you read on, Paul says in verse 9 and 10, and he even appeared to me, me, someone who hated his church, someone who was so awful, but somehow by the grace of God, he has changed me too. And we preached, and by the grace of God, you have believed. Notice that what the early church believed about the gospel is that this was eyewitness account of Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, and appearance to people. People that were still alive at the time that this was being written. People that were still alive. People that you could go interview if this was fake. That's the testimony of the early church, the testimony of Paul, that this was something that was verified it was a historical event. This happened. It's not an idea that sounded good. Their testimony was, it sounds good, but it happened. It's real. And if you want to know, you can go ask those people, people that are continuing to die for what they said they saw, and they're here. And that is the early account of the gospel, that this was something that was an eyewitness account and has been transferred simply as it was heard. This is not a story that appeared 300 years later. This wasn't a myth that was slowly evolving and added to and restructured. This was an early account that has been held up by people and said, this is what God has done to make a way. And that's in crucial in understanding the gospel. Last one, if you'll turn with me to Romans chapter 1. You could do much worse this week for understanding the gospel than just to go home and read all of Romans and then read it again. And it'll give you a good picture of what the gospel is. But just a few verses here to look at in Romans. Again, this is Paul writing to another early church, another early settlement of people that have believed this story. People who had no other reason to believe this. They didn't grow up this way. It wasn't just music to their ears. It wasn't a fad or a trend or the latest thing. They lost lives. They lost families. They lost jobs over this because they heard of a story about a Jewish man named Jesus of Nazareth, a people that they weren't connected to, people they didn't particularly esteem or like. And they heard a story, a gospel story, that this man was not just a regular man, but he was a God man who came and he died, that they could be reconciled to the one true God. And God opened up their ears and their hearts, and they changed in the very core of their being. How did this happen? And then Paul is writing to these people, people who already believe, have already received the gospel. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who were called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then in verse 15, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Isn't that a strange thing? Here's a man saying, I'm eager to preach the gospel to people who have already received the gospel, who have already heard the gospel. Why would he say such a thing? 
My question to you today is, are you eager to hear the gospel? Are you eager to share the gospel as Paul is? Paul gives us his reason for that. He says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. The gospel is a message. It's a proclamation of something that true that has happened, that has transpired, of how God made a way. And Paul says these are not just words. This is not just information, but it's actually in the telling of this, the power of God to save humanity. And it's salvation to everyone who believes, no matter what class you come from, no matter what race, what culture, what background, no matter how dirty you think you are or how clean you think you are, if the world looks up to you, if the world looks down its nose at you, he says this message, this truth is for you, for everyone who believes. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. What is God after? God is after encountering people with this great good news who are most unrighteous so that he will transform them into people who are righteous and who live by faith. Hold on to that and remember that part of the gospel is that it is so concerned with our being of who we are. So let's take a look at one more passage, if you don't mind, a few verses from the Gospel of Luke. Luke 5, verses 12 and 13, gives us a picture of the Gospel in action. While he was in one of the cities, there came a man full of leprosy, complete in leprosy, eaten alive with leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and begged him, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. As we come to hear the gospel, receive the gospel, live the gospel, share the gospel, one thing that's certain that we have to catch and share and accept is the human condition. Part of understanding the gospel is to understand what the Bible reveals to us, what God has declared about our very being. Who are we? What are we? I was driving home this week and I heard this country song. I don't know if you know what it is. I don't know who sang it, but I listened to these words and this was the chorus. I believe most people are good, and most mamas ought to qualify for sainthood. I believe, most, I believe most Friday nights look better under neon or stadium lights. I believe you love who you love, and nothing you should ever be ashamed of. I believe this world ain't half as bad as it looks. I believe most people are good. How about you this morning? The Bible revelation is, yes, the world and half as bad as it looks, it's worse. It's far worse than it even looks. <sighs> it sounds like we've made a mess out of it. Second Chronicles is a book that I've been reading in my own private time, and it's interesting as Solomon goes to dedicate the temple He's asking God, God, will you show up here even when your people do wrong, when your people don't listen? Will you show up here? And every statement he gives is followed with this kind of aside. He says, if they sin against you, and then he stops, for there's no one who does not sin. And everything he says, it's kind of inevitable. We know that people are sinners. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned. Every one of us falls short of the glory of God. When we talk about the human condition, it's not always right to start with 
humanity, the right place to start is actually with God. That's where the Bible starts. And what we start with God is that we have a God who is holy, who is righteous, who is pure, who is just. And that's when the very bad news of who we are in God's eyes comes to us, more catastrophic than any other news about a medical condition or losing a job or catastrophe in your family, the very worst news that will come to you. But the very real thing that we all have to hear is that we are all corrupted people. That ever since Adam and Eve disobeyed God, the human condition has been one of guilt and corruption. That we are people who are sinners, who are far from God, who are called evil, wicked, dark. If there's a silver lining on that, it's that every one of us are in that same sinking ship. There isn't one person here that is better than another person who starts off in life with a better moral condition. No matter what your family upbringing was, as good or as bad as it has been, we all are locked into the same human condition. We've all inherited that same sinful condition from our ancestors. And the root of that problem, the root of this condition, is unbelief in God. The chief sin is humankind's unbelief in God. And not take him seriously for who he says he is and what he says he has done. Not trusting him. Not having faith in him. Not having confidence in him. Not believing him. And our problem and our sin starts because we believe something else over believing in God. Adam and Eve believed in a promise that was not from God. And they believed it was going to give them exactly what they wanted. But all of us believe in all kinds of things. We believe in horoscopes, zodiacs. We believe in ourself. We believe in the evolution of technology. We believe in government able to fix our issues. We believe in our families and our patriotism. We believe in animism and materialism. We believe in all kinds of things, and what we have done is look for them to provide us with things that they can never provide. And on people and ideas, on animals, on traditions, on things, we have placed our hope and our identity and our trust and our belief. Things that can never support what our soul needs. Things that can never provide for us what we really need. And things that never really address our human condition. At best, they just try to cover it up or hide it. And when we have disbelief in God, it leads to disobedience of God. We don't believe Him. We don't trust Him. We don't do what He says. First comes a distrust, then comes a disobedience. And the revelation of the Bible is that disobedience leads us to death. Our disbelief and our disobedience separates us from the life of God. It has brought into the world consequences that are so grave, so devastating, that there's really hardly a word big enough for it. It's called sin. But it's destruction of human life. It's corruption separation, it's damnation, it's condemnation. Because what our disbelief and disobedience does is it locks us in to a slavery of unrighteousness. It locks us into a way of living that is upside down from the reality of God, the way it should be. What God calls good, we call boring and repressive. What he calls life-giving, we call life-choking. And yet, what he calls dangerous, what he calls unfit for humanity to do or to think, we call beautiful, esteemable, worthy to put my life's weight on. And he says, none of that is going to ever be able to support you. You don't have to go far in convincing yourself or convincing someone else that there's something wrong with the world. You see it. We live in a, lot, a world of murder and lies and abuse and manipulation. 
Have you ever thought how silly and strange it is that once you pay for a ticket and go in a movie theater, you still need a ticket stub because they don't believe you? That kind of our default position is you might be cheating us, you might sneak into another movie, that we have to have a little stub to hold around because we don't trust each other. But we see it in our homes. The most rebellious hearts in the cutest little kids. But we see it in our own lives, do we not? In the jealousy, in the distrust, in the pride, in the fear and the anxiety that we have, in our bitterness, our anger, our isolation from one another, our isolation from God. This is not how we were made to live, how we were made to be. And that's where this picture from Luke 5 comes out of, is that the picture of leprosy is one of the clearest pictures in the Bible for what a life of sin looks like. It's a real physical disease that is horrific. It was horrific in the ancient world and it's horrific now where people become disfigured. Noses fall off and faces cave in and digits disappear. People are in absolute pain from their skin. And then there's a numbness to parts of life where they don't feel anything anymore. Are there people who don't know simple things of life? People cut off from work, from families, from hugging their spouse, from picking up their children, from being with friends. And this picture in the ancient world, the picture in the Bible of leprosy, was also a picture of our spiritual condition, that there's something contagious, something that starts inside that people don't see but it involves into this horrific state of isolation, of the walking dead, of separation from God. And this man comes to Jesus, full well of his condition, and it says he falls on his face and begs him. He seems to be sure that Jesus can do something, and he cries out, if you're willing, heal me. And that's where we come to understand in our condition that we are hopeless and helpless people. That if there's a problem in humanity in its being, then no matter how hard my doing is, it can never fix my being. So no matter what externally I try to do, no matter how much merit I try to earn or good things to make up for to balance out, my inside being has been corrupted. Just like a leper who starts taking vitamin C or some ointment on him, it's never going to get to the core problem of what's going on. He needs to be rescued. And he can't rescue himself. Proverbs 20 verse 9 says, Who can say I have made my heart pure? Who can say I am clean from my sin? And this is the question of the human condition then. If this is really what's wrong with us, who's going to put Humpty Dumpty back together again? And this man falls on his face believing that that answer is Jesus. Many religions, many worldviews know there's something wrong with this world. They have definitions for the human condition and what's wrong with it. The gospel message of what's wrong with us is a disobedience, distrust of God, an unfaithfulness to worship Him. But the cure that's going to come really depends on what you think is really wrong with us. The gospel declares that our chief problem is not intellectual, it's not financial, it's not social, it's not biological, it's spiritual. We are in a moral dilemma because we are evil and we have this disease of sin in us. We are lepers. But that's where we come back to look at our great Lord. And part of understanding the gospel message of living it, receiving it, sharing it, is to know our condition, but it's also to know his compassion, his compassion for us. That the Lord God looks down on people like us who are lepers, knowing that we can't self-medicate, we can't self-heal, we can't self-liberate, we can't self-cure. And then really we are hopeless. We are helpless. But it's in compassion that God sees that and doesn't say, get your life together, then come see me. But he comes down into this world, into the thick of all that darkness and evil, and he is the light 
and draws us and saves us from exactly what's wrong with us. But it's out of his great compassion. This is the God who heard the cries of his people Israel in physical slavery, in bondage to Egypt. He heard their cries and he made a way for salvation to deliver them, to bring them to a new life in his presence. This is the same God, Jesus Christ, who then steps down on earth after he's heard the cries for 400 years of his people and been planning all along a way to save this broken, evil world. And he steps in and hearing our cries that he will cure us out of his compassion. People like us, full of spiritual leprosy, This is the great news. God demonstrates his own love toward us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He came for us. To understand this message, to understand and receive it, is to know that our God is a God of compassion and mercy who looked down on us and became the propitiation, became the ransom, became the atonement precisely because we could not because we couldn't save ourselves. In mercy, he came to save us. And that's where we come to exactly the part of the message is God has told us the human condition, but in his great compassion, he does not only tell us what's wrong with us, but he provides a cure. He doesn't only reveal that we are sinners, but he has made a cure for us And this is the cure. He gives us a cure for our evil hearts, a cure in Christ Jesus. In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. That God has been on this mission of reconciling, of fixing, of restoring, of bringing back, of curing people who have been separated because of their sin. Reconciling the world to himself And to do so, he has to not count their trespasses against them. How is a holy God going to deal with unholy people? How is a holy God going to be in relationship with most unholy people? We are told, for Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. The cure comes in his own sacrifice for us. We hear these shocking words that explain that. God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Jesus Christ, sinless, took on our sin so that we could be changed in our being from sinners to the righteousness of God. Astounding news. That the great cure of Jesus Christ is not a few enlightening words. It's not a moral example that he comes in and does heart surgery, so to speak, and gives us a brand new life, a brand new heart. That the cure of Jesus is so shocking, so otherworldly, so radical that the Bible can use no other term than you have been reborn. You haven't been patched up. You've been given a new life. You've been given a new heart a new mind, a life that is accepted by God and a change in your being from sinner to saint, from rebel to child, from outsider to in the family of God. And this is also part of the message that comes with the gospel is that this cure comes in a form of a call. As we saw many times in the scripture that we looked at briefly first in Colossians and Corinthians and Romans and Ephesians, it comes that this great news, this message is going out to people, people who never saw Jesus, and it's coming out in a call. It's coming in a call. Do you know who you are? Do you know your spiritual condition? And let me tell you about the God who has compassion on your soul and on your life. And let me tell you the cure that he has provided in his own son, Jesus Christ, who died for you. In the greatest exchange history has ever known, that his righteous life for our unrighteous life. The death that we deserve to have a life that we don't deserve. 
that he took the wrath belonging to us so that we could have life abundant, life eternal. And this went out in a call to people. And the great news that we heard from our brief look in the Holy Spirit is that he goes in this message, he goes out before, and our hearts for all of us are these kind of walled-off garrisons, walled-off prisons, and it's the Holy Spirit that breaks through that breaks through to deliver this call into our hearts and draw us to Jesus Christ. But it is a call that is to be heard, to be responded to. So why do Christians need to hear the gospel again and again? There's one reason is that our hearts are prone to wander away from God. Our hearts are prone to believe that we are not as bad as that leper picture makes us look. We don't need as much salvation as we need just a little fixing. We're prone to think all kinds of things about ourselves. We're prone to diminish all the holiness and all the wonder of God. We're prone to accept different Jesuses, different gospels. And all of us, the church has always had to hear the gospel again to know the true gospel and the full gospel of the good news of Jesus Christ. But not only are our hearts prone to wander away, but hearing the gospel again and again for Christians should make our hearts wonder in amazement and in joy at God. That as we hear the gospel again and again, as Paul says, I was eager to preach this to people who already bought this and believe it. I'm eager to preach because this news is so good and I want you to continue to wonder at God. That in the Christian life, there should never be any of courseness. Of course I'm saved. Of course I love Jesus. Of course he loves me. Of course my children are saved. It should be wonder constantly. I was that. I was like that and God loved me. I was so unworthy and God died for me. What kind of love is this that God lavishes on my life? It's not what I deserve. It's not what I earned. But he's poured it out to me in grace. This is why even in our communion, we are called to remember Christ, remember what he's done to interact with this gospel, to take it in to have a visual symbol, to do it as a community, to never forget what Christ has done and continue to come to wonder at him how wonderful, how beautiful is our Savior and his good news. The other reason that we are to hear the gospel again and again is because the gospel is much more than just how we enter this life with Jesus. It's more than the four books in our Bible. The good news of God is his plan for salvation that has always been moving and working. In a real, very true sense, the entire Bible is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The entire Bible is the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we need to hear it all, and we need to have it connected by the Holy Spirit in our hearts and in our minds. And so we need, in every passage that we read, hear the gospel. Hear the gospel of God making a way to save lost people, people like us. We need to hear the gospel because we are called to be gospel people. To hear to be gospel people. This should change us. Change our very being. That now we are accepted with God. That we are loved by God. That we have become his children. This should have radical implications very practically for every part of our life. We should be the humblest people on this planet with no right to look down our nose at anybody. I hope this gentleman didn't think we were talking about him. I was talking about myself. We have no right to look down our nose at any single human being, and no matter who you are today, if you feel you're not worthy, join the rest of us. There's nothing good about me or about you except what Christ has done in our life. I am no better, no worse than anybody on the street Anybody in a mansion, I am just who God made me and I am saved and redeemed by him and you can be too. We should be the most humble people on the face of this planet. Everything good I have comes from God. 
And we should also be the boldest people on this planet. Not because I'm confident in myself, but I'm confident that I am saved. I'm confident that I have a message that is true. I have a message that shares the condition of this world, shares the compassion of our Lord God, and it shares the cure that we all need, Jesus Christ. I'm confident that his message is power. Not in how I deliver it, not in how I say it, but in his power and his Holy Spirit. It's power in his word proclaimed. All I need to do is open my mouth and share the truth. Share who he is, what he has done, and all that he's accomplished. We are to share this message, brothers and sisters, because people need it, because God has called us to share it. You don't need any great tricks to share the gospel. You don't need a manual. You don't need a course to take. What you need is a life that's filled up with the truth of Jesus Christ, from his word, from prayer, from worship, a life that knows that this is real and it bubbles out of you and overflows to share the good news with people around you, to simply tell them a story there's all these lepers walking around. Can you relate to them? Do you have a story for them? I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story for those who know it best seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And when in scenes of glory I sing the new, new song, t'will be the old, old story that I have loved so long. I love to tell the story, t'will be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love.